Hi, I'm Ralph Preston, and welcome to our Tuesday Stroke Buddies Stroke Survivors Support Group meeting. Today we've got Michelle Jensen. Uh, those of you that know her like I do really appreciate her for what she does, and those of you that don't know her, this is an opportunity to get to know her. We're going to talk today about a couple of subjects. Um, we're going to talk about personal training, we're going to talk about coaching, the roles of a personal trainer and a coach and how they might be able to um, help you. And um, Michelle's going to talk a little bit about some certifications that she got recently that um, give her a leg up over other people who don't have those same certifications. Um, she's serious about what she's doing, like I am, and like anybody who's trying to pay it forward. If you're trying to pay it forward, you're trying to help people. So the more knowledge you have, the better you can help other people. And if we run out of, of subjects, we can always talk about core and the importance of core. But I don't think we'll have any trouble filling up this hour because Michelle and I can talk about stroke for a very long time. So I'm going to um, get quiet now. And I would ask you, Michelle, just to give us a, a brief um, introduction of yourself. Uh, you can go into your stroke and how you got to where you are just for the people that didn't see you a year ago or uh, we've always got a new audience tuning in so just place yourself in uh, time and space and tell us how you got here and then you know you could even uh, start talking about your role as a personal trainer and uh, and a uh, stroke coach and we'll take it from there okay um well i had a stroke at 25 as the result of a car accident um, I was in the IC for two months following. Um, oh, I was in a coma for two weeks, which is actually when the stroke occurred uh, due to inactivity. I'm guessing nobody actually really ever told me. Um, and so I went from the ICU to a nursing home and 11 months later, I got back home to my parents' house and um, I had a little bit of, well, so I had to learn how to walk, talk, eat all over again. And that was all done in the nursing home. But for OT in the nursing home, my therapist literally filled up a bucket of water, stuck my hand in it and asked me to say hard or cold. Well, I said cold because I mean, as anybody who has had a stroke knows that side is always cold. So I said cold and the water was hot and that was literally the end of it. That was his definition of, I well, I took that as, you can't be helped. And then my outpatient, I had some OT, but all I really remember from those sessions is learning how to zip a zipper. Well, and you know, it's still a struggle, of course, but that's what we worked on was zipping a zipper. And then on my last visit, I got an adaptive tools catalog and I was at the door. So again, I pretty much got the feeling like, like I kind of felt good, given up on and that I couldn't make progress. So for the next two years, I really was depressed, apathetic. I really didn't participate into life at all. It just kind of happened around me. And, um, but luckily two years after my stroke, I went to visit some family in Colorado and in Colorado, my aunt got me walking and um, we went for a hike in the Rockies and it was just, it was just an atmosphere. It was just an attitude of um, wellness and well-being and trying to take care of yourself. And when I got back home to Florida, even though it is 90 degrees outside, I still walked. I walked every day. I walked everywhere. I walked as much as I could. And 
basically, um, four half marathons later, 5Ks, 10Ks, I started a strength training program. And that is really where I saw improvement in my hand. And so I kind of started getting excited and I decided to look into personal training so I could learn more. And it was, it was honestly more for myself in the beginning. Like I wanted to know the ins and outs of body mechanics, kinesiology, all that stuff. I wanted to understand what could help my hand move. And it just evolved into a Facebook group where I wanted to help other stroke survivors stay positive and want to be active post-stroke in therapy and exercise. And um, so that's how everything kind of just started. Well, great. Um, uh, it, it's funny how um, the environment around you has such an, uh, an effect on your positivity or not. Um, I'm sure you thanked your aunt. Um, so, you know, two things you said, and I, I, I don't understand this with therapists, you know, um, if, if your hand doesn't work, why do they try and teach you how to put a chip clip on to pull your, your, your shirt to, why don't they teach you how to get your hand back so you can do what you want to do? I always tell people, if your OT is talking to you about, you know, buttoning things one handed and how to zip a zipper and you want to get your hand better, it's time to either tell them that, get them to flip over or switch to somebody who um, is going to um, work with you. And, that, and that's, you know, I'll say one more thing and I'll let you talk about personal training and coaching, Michelle. And that's, you know, there's people ask about what's the, what about personal trainer? Cause they've run out of physical therapy and personal trainers can be less expensive than paying for your own um, <clears throat> physical therapy. So it's an avenue that people explore. And I think it's a valid one. And I would tell somebody that a personal trainer, they're also a PT, if you will. One PT is almost as good as the other based on whether they're listening to you and whether or not you established your goals and they're helping you to achieve your goals. If you have a physical therapist who is not doing that and you have a personal trainer, and in my experience, personal trainers are coaches. They often work in gyms and things and they're, they're much better at the whole personal side of things and they know a lot about muscles. But the most important thing is, are they listening to you? And are you working on, on your goals? Because a, a PT that doesn't ask you what you want to be able to do is like an OT who's going to teach you to zip something up rather than asking you, you know, do you want, do, do you want to get your hand back? So anyway, so go ahead and tell us a little bit about, you haven't mentioned your YouTube channel and some of your challenges and your new certificates. And there's a lot to talk about in terms of personal training and coaching. So. Okay. Well, so, um, I, and I would a hundred percent agree with you. I think a personal trainer who, um, defines the goals at the beginning and, um, works with you and then and and watches to see what you can do first and doesn't overstep the bounds of their knowledge base and what they are technically allowed to quote unquote prescribe because really the difference between a PT and a personal trainer would be a physical therapist can diagnose the problem and say you need X, Y, and Z. A personal trainer is going to be more focused on the strength side of things, although they do understand body mechanics and when one pushes, one pulls, and they do understand the connection between the brain and the muscles. And I would also say that, so uh, you mentioned my certifications. I've got a couple extra certifications one of them is an exercise therapy and that is really the one that 
dove into some neurology and movement disorders. Number one done. You got number two already. Um, and really dove into movement disorders and stroke and how to design an exercise program. And honestly, it really dove also into defining goals and defining outcome goals. And that's a big thing in um, physical therapy and occupational therapy is outcome goals and setting these goals and setting them to your motivation to comp to get to them uh, is really, it's a big factor in success. And, and that's actually, I mean, they actually did a study on it, but I don't know why you would need to do a study to show that one. Um, but another certification I had, I just completed was in corrective exercise. And so that one is watching your movement in certain exercises and seeing if there is a, like a, I don't want to say a malfunction somewhere, but like a, just if, if something is causing it from, like I said, one thing pushes and one thing pulls. I'm trying to describe it and I'm doing a terrible job, but let me do it this way. So in the body, one thing pushes while one thing pulls. That, I mean, that's the, so that's how the bicep and the tricep work. So one's flexing and the other's extending and vice versa. And so, and, um, so with a corrective exercise, if, if you notice a, like a, a lean or like a gait problem or something like that, and you think that it can be helped with some of the exercises that they taught me, then we would work on corrective exercises to help um, maybe some of those movement patterns become more equal. I was going to say equilibrium, but maybe that's not exactly the right word, but more um, even, even, I guess, is maybe a, a, on both sides of the body and, and front and back. And so, uh, well, and transverse, rotational, but um, so those are the certifications. I feel like I did a terrible job explaining them. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> one, one thing I think, you know, I think it's important to have your um, personal trainer, physical therapist, occupational therapist on board. One of the reasons in terms of setting your goals and, and talking about goals, but we didn't talk about the other side. And that is as a survivor, that's something that you want to do because it helps to focus you. I mean, the main point of it would be for you to have that kind of mindset in terms of your recovery and then get your therapist or trainer or whatever to buy into that. A, a good therapist, I mean, I've had a couple of them where, you know, in that evaluation session, they flat out said, you know, what are your goals? What do you want to do? Why are you here? What do you want to achieve? And that's good. And sometimes stroke survivors haven't really thought about that because they kind of do the, I'm here, make me better thing. Um, so it's important on, on both sides of the equation. I would have to say it's maybe more important to you as a stroke survivor to kind of have that mindset that you have goals. Because if you don't have goals, what are you working towards? Getting better, the elusive getting better otherwise. So setting goals helps define what getting better means to you. Yeah, and, and the beautiful thing about setting goals is you can define De define your success based on the goal. So um, there's a quote out there and I don't recall it offhand, but it's, it's, you can, you can define what you're, well, I, I say this, you can define your recovered. And so therefore you can, oh, I'm doing a terrible job. I have so many so many thoughts and so this is a stroke survivor brain <laughs> um so many different 
avenues I want to go down. And so I'm going down each of them halfway and, and then going down another one. And so I'm not making any sense right now. But if you define, um, maybe I should pass this one. It'll come to me when I'm not trying to think about the, the quote. And so I'm gonna pass that one by, but um, being able to, um, being a stroke survivor, I guess I, I would say helps me a lot when I'm talking to other people. I've worked with Parkinson's people, I've worked with stroke survivors and um, being able to relate in the struggles and the frustrations, I think helps a lot and it also helps um, us form a relationship beyond just a personal trainer and um, client. It's, it's really a friendship. And um, so I really enjoy what I do a lot. Gives you credibility too. I, I, I find that particularly like with my YouTube channel because I I don't try and like pretend I'm perfect or anything. I think there's some beauty in the fact that people can see um, I, I struggle with stuff. In fact, I, one of my recent videos, somebody commented, this is the kind of thing we need. So a veteran like you having trouble um, doing this because I actually shot something, actually shot something I've been shown once at physical, physical therapy and never done or practiced before at home. Anyway, so yeah, you, you have a certain credibility with stroke survivors and, and, uh, and Parkinson's Hopefully. patients. I didn't realize this. So I was working with, uh, I was working with somebody and I had a retired physical therapist. And one day he said, well, you have so much more credibility with her than I do. And I said, baloney, you're the physical therapist. And he turned to me and he said, yeah, but you've walked the walk. So that's not to be underestimated in what you do. The other thing is you've got some knowledge about stroke that should be invaluable to anybody that, you know, that, that you work with. So, um, I've been through it. I've, I've worked like, I basically treat my recovery as my experiment. I, and for those of you, I, I, I didn't share this, but, um, after my stroke, I, well, before my stroke, I was an engineering student and, um, after my stroke, once I kind of snapped out of the depression and, and stuff like that, um, I decided I was just going to go back and finish my degree. And so my background is in engineering. So I really kind of like to reverse engineer work things. And so I really treat my recovery as an experiment. And I come up with a hypothesis and I test the hypothesis, hypotheses. And I really, really... And I've come up with some conclusions and I really try to share them as I come up with them. And then, you know, I've asked people to test them out for me and see how they do. And so um, I really, um, I, that's, it's, it's fun for me. I enjoy it. And so that's, that's how I work my recovery. And it really is like accountability for me as well, keeping on my own recovery uh, to share what I'm learning. Which I, and accountability, I think is a huge thing in, well, so not everyone is like, I was thinking about this this morning, Ralph, you and I are different. Like me post-stroke, I had trouble engaging in life but you grabbed the reins and you took your recovery and you exercised you worked the program you asked for more I was the complete opposite but I'm with you now and um so accountability for me was huge post-stroke which is why I think you know if you're having trouble sticking to a program 
or if you need help beyond PT and OT, which I think most of us do, because I think they they dismiss us, not dismiss, but discharge us uh, far too early before we've reached the goals that we want to get to. Um, but if you're having trouble sticking to a program, that's what you hire a coach for. That coach is there to help you consistently stick to what you can't do on your own. And so that's kind of what I do. It's funny, you know, because I'm the only one. My dad was an engineer and both my brothers are engineers and I refuse to be an engineer, except I am an engineer. But you are. Yeah, you know I am. Uh, because I grew up around that kind of same, you know, mentality that you and I share about, uh, I look at every problem as an opportunity to create a solution like you do. I, I very much experimented on myself. I didn't know what I was doing in the beginning. I lucked into that whole thing, Michelle. You were around some environments that sent you one way. And I'll tell you why I, I jumped on it. And that was because I was scared. I was, I, I. I had a crap scared out of me by this whole thing, and I didn't fancy sitting in a wheelchair forever. And you know, I didn't know what to do about it except to bash on it. So I bashed on it, and but you know it came from that basic fear that we all have uh, post-stroke. You know, my life's been turned upside down. What's going to happen to me? I, I, I I'm, I'm not satisfied with where I am right now. What do I do about it? So. And one thing that's interesting is that you and I also share is, um, and uh, we, I think that uh, Rob and Oxford Davis and I are going to talk a little bit about this next week, and that's um, adapting. Um, you're good at figure like me, you're good at figuring things out and adapting things and making them work and then bringing them to other people. Um, it would be great if every stroke survivor had that ability, but... Um, and they might if they weren't so turned upside down. Like you mentioned, you know, we put so much more effort, uh, energy into the healthcare system does, and we as stroke survivors start thinking about walking before we start thinking about our mental well-being. And it's yeah. not ignored, but, I mean, you get assigned to physical therapy when you leave the hospital. They'll sign you right up. Anybody ever been assigned to mental therapy after they, when they left the hospital? I don't think so. I wasn't. I've asked this question. Everybody shakes their head no like they're doing now. So no. we place more importance on the physical, and, you know, that's great. But if you can't stick to your program, what, you know, what, what good is the, having the best PT in the world if, if you're not motivated to do what they do? What they, think you should be doing so that's right but but then sometimes you but sometimes your your mental your mental state has a lot to do with it if you can be physical if you can walk you're going to be that much happier if you can manipulate things with your hands you're going to be that much happier but so there's that but yeah i mean they should well, it's kind of a catch-22. That's why Michelle and I will always tell people to just do what you can. Get get it moving on any level. And, you know, I, I, I say this all the time. Set small achievable goals because then you achieve your goals and, and that brings you some satisfaction and happiness and, 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 and that can keep fueling your uh, recovery. Um, build the momentum so you can build the traction. Right. So why don't you talk also, to me? Uh, also, uh, achieving your goal will increase the dopamine release in your brain. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a great thing. And uh, is also released right before you start a movement. And so who knows what the connection exactly is there, but there's something. There is something, just like the whole BDNF thing. Um, <laughs> if <clears throat> I think that the more we know about how the chemicals in our brain work in terms of um, positive responses or outcomes, you know that that 
Well, you're like me, Michelle. Basically, as an engineer, we figured the more focused an approach, the more you can, the better you can solve each individual problem, the better you can put the whole thing together, and the more focused approach you take, the more likely you are to have good results. I mean, it's just, it's logic, and it's what engineers, it's what we live on, you know, logic. And, and, yes. and Michelle will tell you, just like me, th when things are illogical, as an engineer type mentality, I, I can't make sense of certain things because they defy logic and I apply the logic model to everything, probably like you do. Yes. So, so how do, let's talk a little bit about how do you, how do you, um, how do you start uh, to build a positive mindset and, and how do you maintain it and how do you, as, how do you and I as coaches and I'm not a, personal trainer. I'm not a physical therapist. I don't know what I am. I'm somebody who has learned a lot about as much as I can about PT and stroke and, and movement, but I don't have any certifications. But it's important for us to, to uh, try and keep people motivated because otherwise they're not going to do their homework. And then as a coach or PT, you want to get into a positive uh, spin up with them, not a negative spin down so give me a little of your thoughts on how to get somebody started and how to keep them going with a um, positive mindset so uh well i think you know and i just posted a, a meme on this in my facebook group today this morning um one of the first things and i know this i know this is not the first time anyone's heard this but it's to know your why and if you have a strong enough why you want to get somewhere, what your goal is and why you want to achieve that. Like, I know there was one gentleman, uh, a stroke survivor, who he wanted to walk so he could walk his daughter down the aisle. You know, that's a, that's a huge why. And maybe not everyone has a, that strong of a why, but if you know exactly why you're wanting to do the therapy in the first place, what got you started, um, that can sometimes pull you through those frustrating times, which are going to happen in stroke recovery because it is the most slow process you will ever encounter and endure so having a strong why that can help pull you through is a good start but it's not always helpful i i think i think everyone's like know your why but they don't often have anything behind that but another tactic that i personally used was basically fake it till you make it. And if I tell myself I'm happy, I'm going to smile through this. Eventually I'm actually smiling for real. And I would, I would go into the groups and I would start to encourage people and I would start to help them. And that was really, really what got me into that positive space and surrounding yourself with like-minded people people that want to achieve the same kind of goals that you do whether it's therapy related or not whether it's just in life you want to be have somebody a companion you know what it just surround yourself with people who are trying to better themselves. It in turn helps you be better. Well, and your group will, of course, for everybody listening, um, we're gonna, we'll put, I'll put up all the ways to get in touch with Michelle, her group, her YouTube channel, her blog, her website, and such in the description underneath this video. Um, but, you know, um, you're one of the few group owners like, like me that is actively involved in your group, making videos, whatever. And I think the difference between our groups and some of the other groups out there, I'm not here to point fingers or name names or anything, but is that 
what made me think about this is what you were talking about, about surrounding yourself with positive people. That's one reason that I'm <laughs> always um, trying to make sure that um, my group is uh, a place where if if you're a new person and you land there, I want you to experience the community and the positivity. And um, so I think that you're one of the few other people that realizes that the importance of that um, in, in building a, a community and not just a, a group where you can post memes and have pity parties and argue about God. Um, so um, that's one reason that um, I like your group. In fact, I, I realized I hadn't been posting my recent videos and um, I, I'm going to go back and do that uh, because, yes. but, well, it's, no, it's, it's not for me. It's not for you. It's just, it's, it's for everybody out there. And the, and the other fact is the things that make our groups more dynamic than other groups are the involvement of the other people, people making videos and posting things, people being welcoming, people answering questions. I mean, I run other groups. I run one of the, another group uh, that, um, you know, where there are more memes, pity parties and arguing about God, literally. And uh, so I applaud you for that because y your group's um, different than a, a lot of the other groups out there. And I think it's because you recognize the importance of community and positivity and surrounding yourself with everyone in recovery, surrounding themselves with uh, positive people. So. Uh, uh, Sorry, I'm going to interrupt. I have a question for Michelle. Sure. Yeah. After the stroke, what side was your affected side? My left, and so my non-dominant. Uh, and so I, I don't know if you guys, uh, so my hand, it, it, it basically moves all together, although not as much as it used to. Like I can move my index by itself and um, I, my thumb is still really the thing I work on the most, but so that's, this is still my struggle. This is still my, my goal is to get a functional hand and I'm going to get there. And um, I know that if anyone else has a goal like that to get function back or to walk better, to, to do anything, you can do it. It, it, you are only stopped by the limitations you place on yourself. It, it's mindset, a hundred percent. You, you, the, the improvements only stop when you stop. It's, it's really, really, you are the one that decides. I always say, I, I'd like to say that you get to decide what your recovered is. You decide where you want to be, where you would be happy waking up to be every day. And and don't stop till you get there because you will get there. It's 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 not easy. No one's saying the road's gonna be without trials and tribulations because it will have them. But the only the only way you're not going to get there is if you stop trying. And it's, it, it's a hard fact, but it really is the truth. I mean, science, I, Dr. Adler, I, I, science proves it, right? Pretty much, yes. Well, and I did have a question for you. I th yeah. think at the outset, you said that after your stroke, you had to learn how to talk again. Is that true? Yeah. Actually, that, Botox put in my vocal cords because I couldn't, they weren't touching each other. And so. Oh, okay. So it was not a brain <laughs> problem, but a vocal cord problem. It was vocal cord and, well, you know, and oh. the tongue going to one side. It wasn't yes. aphasia. It was mm -hmm. more uh, the, the motor. The Okay. Because I, I was a little confused because you said your left hand was affected. That means a right hemisphere stroke. Right. But in 90% of people, it's the left hemisphere that controls language. Right. So 
Yep. So mine was more <clears throat> motor control and okay. the ability to um, make it happen. Um, um, I, I guess post-stroke, I, I could whisper, but my parents were lucky that I couldn't yell at them. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> because I mean everyone knows you kind of want to scream sometimes after a stroke when you are so frustrated yeah. and there's just I nothing else yeah, that I get so do. frustrated because and then I just cry I don't know what to do with myself I I'm with you I still cry sometimes at like, frustration I'm trying to open my hand and it's in my mind. I feel like I am opening, but it's nothing's happening. So that puts me into big frustration. And I feel like my whole body is trying to help to open that left hand and it's just not working. Do you open it with your other hand? Yes. Okay. That, that would and help. While you're opening it with the other hand, continue to think in your brain, I'm opening my hand. I'm opening my hand. As you're doing that, just keep thinking that and repeating that because it will help the neurons connect. Dr. Hetzel will tell you it's called mental imagery or mental practice. Yes, that's correct. So if you if you imagine that that your left le I think it's your left hand, perhaps. Left if you hand, imagine yeah. that your left hand is opening over and over and over again, that will help it open. In reality, also using your good hand to open it, that's called passive uh, movement, that will also help it. So if you use your right hand to open your left hand, say a hundred times in sequence, and combine that with mental imagery where you think it's opening, that will help it get better. I talk to my hand a lot. I'd go, come on, hand. You That's can, what uh, I said, like, come on, Maurice. <laughs> Do something. Well, Ralph, does your hand talk back to you? No, it didn't. <laughs> if, it ever, if, if it ever did, I have to slap you it. You know, especially it, when it's it cold, me. it's like my whole left side is frozen. I can't do anything. It has to be really warm. And I feel like my left side is always cold. Have you tried um, getting uh, taking a hot shower before you try and work it? Yes. Yes. Okay. And uh, also, when I like in the when I wake up in the morning and when I stretch in my bed, I see my left hand. The fingers are like this, which is looser. Yeah. Have you tried moving them? Your brain kind of resets overnight, and a number of people will tell you that they got uh, David Lauderdale first one who brought this to my attention, and I pointed it out to. 20, 40, 50 stroke survivors, I don't know. And most all of them have reported the same sort of thing. Of course, the biggest issue is when I wake up in the morning, it's usually because my bladder is telling me to wake up. Yes, and, me too. Yeah, <laughs> all, all of us, you know. So you have to, it doesn't typically work before, I mean, after. Otherwise, I would like to stay in bed and sleep a little longer, but it's like, I got to go to the bathroom. Yes, that, that's true. And uh, I, I should point out that as far as sleep goes, you know, there are various stages of sleep. And one of those stages is called REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep. And that's the time when you dream. And basically, I'm not going to waste a lot of time here, but you have about five REM periods over the night and they get progressively longer. And the last one, right before you wake up usually, can last an hour or more. Now the interesting thing is during REM sleep, your body is paralyzed. You cannot move it. Wow. So your, your affected hand might be clenched when you go to sleep but when you wake up, most people wake up in the middle of a dream, your hand will not be clenched because it will be paralyzed. Now, when you wake up, you're no longer in REM sleep and it may go back to being clenched, but it, but it may also be open for a while because it has been paralyzed 
during this time. David discovered, I'm sorry, I'll let you just talk in just a second. So David discovered this because his wife gets up early. He also discovered that when he stood up, you, when you stand up, you engage up 206, 210 muscles, take that first step, literally, because you got lots yeah. in the core and everywhere. And it no longer works. Um, so what David started doing was um, setting his alarm so that he would wake up before his bladder was talking to him and he could work that hand somewhat in, oh. in the mornings. And then he, he built on that. Um, the, the secret is um, getting it going because once you get something started, in my experience, I think it's true, Michelle's kind of agreeing. You don't, don't, haven't you found, Michelle, once you got something going or people got something going, you can, even no matter how slow it is, you, you can build on it? Oh, yeah. Once you see any little movement, I mean, this is what I work with people on. Once you see that first little bit of movement, that's what you build on. That's what you work on, is you continually make that more and more. Of course, uh, Sophia is sitting there saying, but I have to get it moving first, right? I mean, you know, I, I sat there too. And I actually got my hand moving through the mental. I, I have to talk to my hand more often, I guess. <laughs> I, it, I, it does help. It really it does. does. I, I do it with people I coach too. Do you ever do this, Michelle? Like I'll, I'll count it out when when we're doing, uh, I sometimes do PT with them because that's one way to make sure that they do it. I actually do too. I, I Because it, it's helpful for me too. And so yeah. if we're working on some of the same things, why not? And as long as I can still keep an eye out, you know, for any form, uh maybe some corrections that might need to happen then then yeah why not get your pt as well i think it also helps form that bond that's important between yeah. coach or, or personal trainer we haven't talked about that we talked about well we we brushed on it um you know setting goals and trying to have a good relationship um has Got, you know, it, it's important because it's going to end up fueling um, you as well. The, the, I always, I like to like my physical therapist. And I like to go in and show them that I'm doing my homework. And so if I got somebody that, you know, I'm not hitting it off with, I, it's harder to have that kind of relationship. So I think that that, that that's a, a, a good thing. The other thing is, I think Dr. Hetzel will agree with this, and that's a part of mental imagery and part of making the blueprint involves all of the different senses. The more senses that you can involve, the better, and they can be, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, the more you can include, the better. There's one other thing I thought I'd briefly mention. This is a little more esoteric and not directly related to stroke, but Michelle began, I think, by talking about dopamine release before a movement. But, and again, this is complicated, so I'll try to make it quick, but not all dopamine release is the same. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter released from axon endings. Now, there are several dopamine pathways in the brain. One of those is involved in movement. Another is involved in pleasure. So now, uh, if you want me to just shut up, I'll shut up. No, no. Go. OK. The movement pathway is the nigrostriatal dopamine pathway. The cell bodies are located in the substantia nigra of the midbrain that's down in the brain stem. They send their axons up through the brain to the striatum, which is the caudate and putamen of the basal ganglia. So they release dopamine there. This pathway gradually degenerates as you age. When 80% of those neurons are dead, that's when you develop Parkinson's disease. Whoa. Oh, so, so that's the movement pathway. There is another pathway, the mesolimbic dopamine pathway. 
The cell bodies are again in the midbrain, in the ventral tegmental area of the midbrain. They send their axons forward in the brain to the limbic system, which is various structures, including the nucleus accumbens. When dopamine is released in the nucleus accumbens, you feel good. Various drugs of abuse, like heroin or cocaine, cause or alcohol, cause release of dopamine in the nucleus accumbens, and that's why they are rewarding. That's why you want to take them again. But also, if you accomplish something, like your hand moves, you release dopamine in that mesolimbic pathway, and you feel good about yourself. Cool. I'll shut up now. Oh, no, 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 no. That's really interesting, though. My my stroke was in my brain somehow and was really in my midbrain. It affected the uh, the midbrain. Dude, uh, it affect your happiness for other than you know. I mean, yeah. the... other other than I mean, I do stuff because that's what makes me happy. I work out because it makes. I understand the dopamine release, not on a scientific level like all you guys do, but I mean, I eat yogurt every morning because of gut health. I work out, I, I, I set small goals for myself every day to meet those. And I mean, I'm as happy as I can be. I mean, I'm still depressed that I had a stroke and I mean, all you guys talk about hand movement, and that's great. And I, you guys are lucky you're going to get it back. I have nerve damage. I'm not going to get my hand back. My hand has, has essential tremors. It's, you know, it is what it is. But yeah, I had my stroke right in the mid, in the brain stem right in the mid brain. Yeah. You're lucky to be alive. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I hear. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, not every one of us understands the way the brain works on the level of Dr. Hetzler. Uh, he's a neuroscientist, <laughs> PhD neuroscientist. He taught this for 41 years, is it? 43 years. 40, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut two years off. That's okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, I love the science behind all this because Michelle's not in her head there because we're back to being engineers again, right? Engineers, <laughs> like, what's science, okay? <laughs> I'm okay with it. <laughs> if I'm going to create a solution to this problem, what science or what logic or what kinds of, you know, tools and things, you know, can I bring into this? So we appreciate you, Dr. Hetzler. Yes. Well, thank you. Uh, now I just wish my wife would appreciate more. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're a lucky man. You know it. Abraham. Oh, that is true. Said, Go ahead. What's that? What side of stroke that affected you? Um. Well, it's my left hand and my Your right left leg. Side? And well, my right leg and my left hand. Interesting, because of the brainstem. Right. Yeah. But like oh. you said, I I feel the same. I used to work all around the landscaping. That was making me happy in the spring and summer and fall, and I can't do any of that. Mm. And now I'm just like, you know what, whatever. So that makes me depressed and I just cry and I'm just angry because I can't do what I used to do. Could you try good. maybe getting like a small potted, uh, like a, a tray and maybe just do the, the, just grab a, see my daughter of flowers like a little a bench and I can sit in front of it and just like pick up weeds or yeah I, just I, in I, a I, smaller area so that way you can still get the pleasure from the gardening yeah that's why she got it for me because it's yeah it is small but and I tried to do it last week but it's a little small it's kind of hard because I have to like bend over a little bit sitting and it's a little hard and you know because left side it hurts whatever i touch it hurts but all that bending over and such is making you um better if you will um you know um 
something like gardening, you can push yourself in ways that you're not really aware that you're pushing yourself because you want to perform the tasks. I'll tell you that I, I built, I personally built a garden for a stroke survivor in a wheelchair. Uh, I was taking stuff to the dump and somebody was throwing out these fabulous uh, giant pots and I, they were handsome blue pots. I turned them upside down and put boards on them and brought them to the edge of the garden and she could access about, I had like a couple of 12 footers. She had 20 or 30 feet of, um, of gardening, if you will. It was on uh, shelves that she could access. Also, Michelle, we could uh, hook her up with um, Polly Hutchison because yes. Polly recently did something. She feels the same way that you do and she recently built a small garden on a bench on, I think it was on her front porch. There's a railing in the shot. I'm, I'm I think it's her back porch, I, back but porch. I could be, I could be wrong, but it, well, it doesn't matter, but, but she did, she built herself a little area because she was having trouble getting out into her backyard and um, gardening was something that brought her joy. And so she, she also had somebody do some work in her, back garden to make it maybe more accessible to her or something. And, you know, uh, Sophia, you might not be able to make the shelf, but if you get somebody to make the shelf, then you can tend the plants. And tending the plants is like having a kitten to me. You know, it's something that you're deeply connected to and uh, brings you joy. There's Michelle's kitten. <laughs> <laughs> She's been with me the whole meeting. Yeah. They're they're loyal. They like to lay on the keyboard too. Yes, they do. They she wants to be where where I'm trying to be. Like if I'm trying to read a book, she is sprawled across the page. Right. And or if I'm trying to type, she is coming to the keyboard to block it. <laughs> right. She's, Pay well, attention to me. <laughs> basically, yeah, that's what she's saying. Pay attention to me. Rub rub my head. Pat me on the head, mom. Well, yeah. you know what we're talking about, Sophia. I mean, you know, you feel I'm a gardener. So, you know, when when my tomatoes are doing great and making like lots of tomatoes, I'm like, I'm like a happy camper because, well, first of all, I get to eat them. And second of all, I can see it's back to the same thing we've been talking about the whole time. Right, Michelle? You get to see the reward for the effort. Yeah. And if you can stay connected to that whole motivation effort reward cycle then i think you you know that to me that's what i did that's what i try and get other people to do the people that i see getting better um maintain that kind of cycle i mean look at say neil isaac he posted a video yesterday four years and five months walking every day made it up the steps all 17 floors without touching anything wow that's really hard because um, I can tell you that um, it's one of the things that I I still have issues with. I don't have to touch anything. I'm going to do something really weird right now. Are you carrying our laptop? In, let's see. Where is it? Why can't I find it? Let me put my finger on it. Oh, because I'm way too high. See that? I don't need to touch the I don't need to touch the molding every time I go into the bedroom, but I can't turn my brain off to it. Go so I'm so. actually worn the paint out. <laughs> I have to repaint certain places in my house um, every couple of years. It's time to do it again. Because the brain tells you, you know, to do things for safety. And it's, it's really hard. This is one of the reasons I talk about um, bad habits, not trying not to develop bad habits. Because, like, this is a habit that I'm 14 years out. I haven't needed to touch anything for 13 and a half. But I still do occasionally. Can't stop the brain. I used to paint the whole house all by myself, but I don't think I can do that anymore. First of all, I'm getting older, so that's not going to happen. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to be climbing the ladders anymore. <laughs> I got, I probably got 20 years on you. And so does Dr. Hetzler. But anyway, um, 
and so does Billy. But anyway, I would say believe. Uh, you know, keep working on what you're trying to do and get some plants going and try and believe, try and keep that positive yes. mindset. That's all you can do. Yes, and the more you do it, the easier it'll be. Right. That's right. So the more you the more you try to work with the plants, the easier it will be. That's what my daughter keeps telling me, my older one. She's the one who pushes me all the time. When I say I can, she said, you know, you can. You know what the magic word is? You can't yet. Put a yet after everything that you have said. You might may not be able to paint the whole room at once yet, but start one wall at a time and start with the baseboards. That's right. See that see that ceiling? Yep. I yep. got up on I got up on a last tongue groove ceiling. It took me and my brother in law four days to put that up. And it looks I, good. <laughs> I ended up. Good. It was scary as hell because I had to yeah. be on the other end of the boards at the top of a ladder. It's thirteen feet tall. Oh my right goodness! Oh, wow. <laughs> but my brain doesn't like it. I don't mind being on ladders as long as I got one hand holding on. I'd prefer it be my I right hand yeah. because I'm, uh, I, I had, I'm left affected and I have more coordination in my right hand. But when my right hand is holding on to the ladder. That's and, crazy too, because I did a lot with my left hand too. Well, I used to be left-handed, but. Yeah, but, I do a lot with my left hand. Like if I'm out there gardening, I'm using my left hand okay. more than my right hand. My right hand is just like a little help. So that's crazy. Is that pre-stroke you're talking about? So is your left hand your dominant hand? No, my right hand. Yeah, so you're uh, amphibious or ambidextrous. 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 Well, I know. I just I once heard He's ambidextrous with both hands. I once heard uh, I was in the supermarket <laughs> checkout and I heard a woman. To, uh, yeah, I was eating with my left hand. I guess when I was a little kid, I started doing everything with my left hand. And back in the day, you weren't supposed to, so my mom didn't let me. She's like, no, you have no, to do it with no. your right hand. So, so they kind of switched me over. <laughs> my, uh, They did that to my brother, and I was left-handed until I stuck that finger in a meat grinder, because guess what? I stuck that finger in, not that finger in. And I'm also artistic, and artistic people are typically left-handed. So um, you're ambidextrous. Whereas that girl once said, she told somebody, yeah, I can use both hands, I'm amphibious. <laughs> <laughs> and then I heard a famous sports star, he's a football player, he made the same mistake. I just think it's funny. Actually, you know, I refer to it as amphibious now. <laughs> oh, I knew that little laugh. <laughs> hey, you know what? Michelle will tell you, part of coaching and everything is, you know, there has to be some levity, some light side to the whole thing. Yeah. Um, a good coach is also reveals himself as a human being to the people they're working with. Uh, you know, you have, we I, all have faults. You're not. I mean, I'm not perfect. I don't. I just have keep all the asking answers. myself, like, how did this happen? Do you keep oh, asking yourself oh, that. Why? That writes better. Sometimes there's not a reason why, and 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 does there have to be a reason why? Do you need, um, maybe there's a reason why you survived versus That's why. That's what I'm saying. God probably has a plan for me, and I had to be here. Yeah, that was the first thing that really helped me was to realize, because not everyone survived the car accident that I was in. But I did. And so there has to be a reason why I survived. And there has to be a reason why you survived. And hold on to that. Try and find that reason. And, and don't focus. I mean, this is easy for me to say. And I'm not trying to say to somebody depressed, just get over it. Because that doesn't work. But the, there is no answer. There's no answer as to why. I mean, you can come up with a... Um, a reason you can, of course, Dr. Hetzler is saying, well, you know, they had to, had to have a stroke in a certain area. It had to be caused by something. 
but you're talking about the bigger picture reason, not the you know not the mechanics of of your stroke, um, and that's tied to your personal spiritual beliefs and and and, and lots of things. But uh, I just found, well, I'm the type of person that when I when I ask myself a question like that, I grind on it. I mean, I grind on it like. I can grind on it all day and all night and not sleep even. I could wake up in the middle of the night and start grinding on it. I don't do this much. I try not to, but there's there's not really any answer to the bigger picture. So you're here, try and make the best of it, try and find the new you, try and find some happiness, try and find some purpose. Um, Sometimes it's hard. Uh, there's um there's lots of um there's lots of good people and lots of beauty in the world and i'm personally glad i'm still here and when i get when i have days well you know stroke recovery um overall and on a day-to-day -day basis really comes down to it's not so much what happens to us it's the way that we respond to it. And, and that's true in what I'm trying to talk to you about in this big picture thing. Um, I, I would suggest not trying to find the answer to a question to which I'm not sure there is an answer. There is an answer to- I really appreciate that. There is an answer you to your- already. Thank you. No, it's okay. There is an answer to you Finding purpose in life will, you know, make a, a, a lot of difference um, to you. Um, so I, that's one reason I jumped on the gardening thing because that was I don't know you well enough, to, but that was one thing that I could clearly hear from you made a difference to you. I always tell people two things: if when you're trying to find the new you, don't look for the old you. Yeah, they're gone. Um, yes, I said this, definitely. believe it or not, I said this about uh, 15 minutes before I walked out of the rehab hospital. I, I, I was talking to a nurse. I was nervous. I was waiting. I didn't know if I could walk. I'd only walked once the day before. And when I get nervous and I've got a lot of energy, I'll like talk to people. So I was talking to a nurse I didn't even know at the nurse's station waiting for my PT to come up and walk me out. And... Uh, she just said something and I said about me and new me and old me. I said, the old me is dead. It's gone. I'm okay with that. And I said, I'm going to try and be the best new me I can be. It just came out of my mouth. And um, uh, Wendy, how many times have I said that since uh, in 14 years? I think it's around uh, 3,000. Anyway, it, you know, it's true. That's what I would work on. Try and find a new you. Be the best new you you can be. Take advantage of what you got. I don't want to use the word left. I don't want to use the word left. Don't take advantage of what you have left because that implies a loss. Yep. See, the other <laughs> thing is when we have yeah, anniversary. I don't know if you heard about Bob Proctor. I listen to him too sometimes. Bob Proctor. Don't know him. I don't know. I'd love he to. He gave an example of the hourglass, and then on the bottom there is a sand, and then the top is a sand. So he said, the bottom is the past. The top <laughs> is the future. We don't know how much is sand is in the, in the top part. That's right. So let's just focus on that. Yeah, let's and your to... stroke <laughs> showed you that you still have sand left in the top. And so, right. right. The bottom is already past. So just leave the past and just focus on the top of the well, be people... present, be mindful in the moment. That's yes. Yeah. Focus on the present. Make That's the right. most of today. That's right. Yes. Uh, any and every coach will always tell you, you know, to uh, be there in the present, focus on the present, because mm -hmm. tomorrow's a promise and yesterday's gone. And I think it's the way right. the meme goes. So you can't do anything about it. Yesterday's history, tomorrow's a mystery, but we have the moment we are in 
that at that moment. I, I don't I don't remember that last part of the of the quote, but yeah, that's the yesterday is a mystery or yesterday's history, tomorrow's a mystery. Today is a gift. That's why today is a gift. Yeah, that hey, then that works. Yeah. It's all the same thought though. Exactly. Being the present moment. In the sense that, you know, you got something. Make the best of it. I mean, that, that's what it comes down to. And I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, I, I went through this, Michelle went through this. She basically told you she got into a mindset where she didn't even work her hand for a number of years. So it's not Bye. something, we understand it's not something you can just snap your fingers and, and do away with because I would have snapped my fingers long before I, I managed to kick it in the butt. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, you have to kick it in the butt. We can help you, but you have to have the mindset that, okay, I'm going to have somebody make me a garden because I love to do that, and that will make me feel better. And if you start taking little steps towards feeling better, then you're going to be more inclined to do your therapy. You're going to be more balanced and happy during life. Yeah. It's, I have this thing that, Things either spiral up, nothing's static, nothing stays the same. Um, things either spiral up based on all the little things that happen positively, or they tend to spiral down. So if you're going to move one way or the other, I always try and choose up. Did I have days, and did Michelle have days uh, where, uh, yeah, where you had to oh, fake it so you. you can make it. Some people hate that term, by the way, Michelle. I don't quite understand why. I also called it dive to tomorrow. Tomorrow's another day. So get through today however you can. That doesn't mean going to bed at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. But if you're done at 9 o'clock at night and you're not going to mess up your sleep, you know, go ahead and dive till tomorrow. And in the meantime, yeah. try and do some things that bring you some joy. Because as human beings, I think that, most of the time, unless you're in a pretty deep depression, most of the time we wake up with a positive attitude. I, I know I do. We take a quick survey. Anybody else wait? Uh, every day is a, like, you know, brand new opportunity for me. Yeah. Nothing has messed it up yet. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, uh, if that's got to be I put my feet on the ground, and then, yeah, I have a good attitude about the day. Mm-hmm. I mean, my body, I have, I mean, I, I hate to, I'm sorry, I hate to rain on your parade, your meeting, I don't want to bring it down. I'm oh, no, no. Not having a great day, I'm just, lots of chronic pain today. You're, you're not having a good day today? No, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm no. bringing anything down, I don't want to. Um, we're all entitled to him. I, I got a, a message this morning from a friend of mine who's 53 years old. He's got a 12-year-old and a, and a 10-year-old daughters, and he's dying of heart failure, and he wasn't having a, a, a good day. And um, I've known him for 15, 20 years. We used to work together. And he's, he knows I'm somebody that understands what he's going through, even though I'm not suffering from heart failure. This is, you know, back to Michelle, we have a certain empathy and understanding with stroke survivors. And even with Parkinson's, even though you haven't had Parkinson's, a Parkinson's patient knows that you have dealt with some of the very same issues. And I'm not talking about the physical issues, although some of them are even... Some of them are very similar. Very yeah. similar. Same as uh, same with TBIs. When my friend had a TBI, I was shocked how similar he presented to stroke. It was like a lot like a uh, cerebellum. He didn't have the coordination issues, but he was. Uh, I'm sure there's a term for it. Not hemiplegic, biplegic. He had both sides were affected. Um, so, is Dr. Hetzler shaking his head? So maybe it is bi. Well, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a bilateral effect, both both sides. Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, people present the same. So, you know, what they what the thing that helps them identify with you and, and me, Michelle, is the fact that, well, first of all, they know that we care. 
that's really important to convey to people when you're trying to coach them it's important to um, convey the fact that you care I believe because that kind of establishes that connection but the thing that that, that really helps with Parkinson's as well as stroke is that they know that we've dealt with this mental aspect of, mm. of the whole thing They know that we've gone through trauma know that we've gone through like staring out into the world and not knowing what the heck was going to happen to you that's that's I mean to me that was one of the scariest parts like I said I got real scared and jumped out of a darn wheelchair as soon as I could because out of basic fear I actually said to my wife the long on day five day six of, out of the rehab hospital I said the longer I sit in this wheelchair the more afraid I get that I'm gonna get stuck here so she and said one, one nice thing if it is a nice thing about having a stroke as opposed to Parkinson's disease is Parkinson's disease gets progressively worse. worse. So it yeah. will continue to get worse. With a stroke, you, you can, can get, get better. better. Yep. You have to work at it, but you can. You know what? I tell the story, but I think this might have a, a, a bigger effect than I've ever given it. I've just had a light bulb moment here. So I'm in the rehab hospital and my next door neighbor, uh, uh, came. I was surprised he drove an hour and 15 minutes each way to visit me in the hospital. I thought it was nice. And I wasn't trying to have a pity party, but I was talking about, you know, I'd been in the rehab hospital four or five days and I was in neuro about five days. So it was, you know, week, 10 days out. And I had a little time to think about it. And I had, was talking to him and I had no idea what he was about to say. And I said something about, I couldn't say the S word for stroke. I still couldn't say it then. You know, I, I had a stroke. It's like part of you just doesn't want to accept what, what has happened to you. And so after that, he said, uh, oh, I completely understand. I got diagnosed with Parkinson's. And he said Parkinson's out loud uh, about a month ago, about two months ago. And I wasn't able to say the P word for about a month. And that night, I wasn't trying to have a pity party then either, but that night when everybody else is asleep and I'm, they all went to ate dinner at 4.30 and went to sleep at like 6 o'clock at night. And I, I ate at 5 or 7 before the shift changed because if I didn't, they would take my food away. And I ate it cold because I wasn't going to eat at 4.30. Um, anyway, so I was laying there, you know, just wondering what the heck was going to happen to me. I thought to myself, Ralph, you can get better. Harvey's going to get worse. And I, I, I'm I, still friends with Harvey. He's doing real well. I don't certainly didn't wish him any harm by that thought, but it was very inspirational to me in the sense I thought, okay, well, you know, just they always say, if you think when you're really feeling bad, look around because you can find somebody who's got it worse than you. And here was somebody who I immediately said, Hey, you know, you might have had a stroke, but Harvey's got Parkinson's and you can get better and he's going to get worse. So I, it was maybe one of the first times I started like turning that switch towards, okay, Ralph, get up, do it, get out of this wheelchair. Plus when the doctor told me um, uh, that I might be stuck in the wheelchair, I might never walk again. I looked at him and I said, you don't know me just like that. And uh, so when you make a bold statement like that, it's important to back it up. And I went back, uh, I went back a year later and I took an article to, to my therapist and that uh, he was a nurse practitioner, but he, he actually did me more good than the doctor did. I took in an article where I had uh, returned to, I, I had my stroke training for the senior games and I went back a year later and rode my bike. I still can't run to this day. I probably could if I wanted to spend a year on it, but I um, decided it's more important to me to help other people than it is to run. So this is what I do. And uh, so I took that article back and I remember my PT when she pinned it up on the old uh, uh, cork, ch uh, cork pinup board. What do we used to call them? Anyway, I don't have them anymore. But as she, as she pinned up the articles, she went, 
a stroke survivor, riding his bike and doing the senior game. She kind of muttered it under her breath, but I, I, I heard it. So uh, I made good on that promise. So. I don't <laughs> understand. Can, did she not believe that you could do it? I think that doctors, this is a, we could have an hour meeting on this, right, Michelle? Oh, yes. Why, yeah, why yes. do doctors tell you that? Okay, there's several things. You won't hear it from a 25-year-old nurse. You might hear it from a 65-year-old doctor. Reason is because they didn't believe in neuroplasticity 40 years ago. So if you're old enough of a physician, you are actually trained that the brain can't get better. Or you are trained you have a finite number of brain cells. And right. once you use them up, you were that was it. You couldn't learn anything else, nothing changed in the brain. And some of these doctors still have that mentality, right, Ralph? It's it they just they it's like it hasn't been part of their continued education that neuroplasticity is possible. I think there are a couple other reasons too. Uh, See, they can't factor in. They don't know you. That's what I said to them. You don't know me. Um, so they can't, he can't factor in the, he can't look at me and say, this, well, I had a second doctor and he told me, you know what he told me? He said, I think you're going to be all right. And I said, what are you basing that on? And he said, you're stubborn. <laughs> and I said, doc, I'm beyond stubborn. I'm pigheaded. And uh, but I but I also realized that I could use that, if you will, use that in, in my own recovery. What you have to do is you have to look at yourself, try and figure out what your strengths and weaknesses are and try and use your strengths. So I'm stubborn, so I wouldn't give up. So I applied that stubbornness to my recovery every day. And did I have days when I didn't feel like doing 10 hours a day? I did 10 and 10 to 12 hours a day every day. Did I have days when I didn't feel like doing that? Hell yeah. What did I do? Sucked it up. I just put my, sucked it up, put my head down and did it anyway. And, and like Michelle said, sometimes if, if you just go ahead and do that, you'll start to feel better. The other thing is if you keep doing that, you, uh, what do they say? It takes five days to build a habit. Oh, no, it takes 21 days. Oh. So supposedly, I'm actually putting, I'm actually testing that theory. So, um, oh, so yeah. I'll get back to you on that one. I, I've been testing a few theories, and that is when you make a list and you decide you're going to change on Monday morning at 9 o'clock and you make this long <laughs> list and you say you act like you're going to flip a switch and make all these changes Monday morning at 9 o'clock, guess what? You're setting yourself up for complete failure because there's no way that you're not factoring in how you feel. I always say I, I try and slide into change. I try and make it happen and then slide into it and then define it. When you define it, you, you know, maybe you you got to be careful not to set the bar too high that you can't jump over it. That's all right. Small, attainable right. goals. You right. know, I have to jump in because we've we talked a, a little bit about mindset, a lot about goals. Um, next Thursday, I was going to do a mindset, like a, a, a recovery mindset and goal session, kind of explaining how mindset is really one of the most important parts. Like you said earlier, when you leave rehab, you're signed up for PT, but you aren't signed up for a psychologist, a therapist, someone to walk you through all the emotional changes, all the mental part of it that it's going to take for your recovery. Um, and so mindset's a huge deal. And if you can get into a positive mindset, and if you can set those goals and start to attain the, the first small ones and get a little bit of traction. Um, so I'm going to talk about how mindset can work for us in recovery um, next Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern. 
Make sure that you, I have that link. Yes. Of, you don't need me to post it in Stroke Buddies or Young Stroke. Make sure you do that. I'll put it in. I'll put it in with um, the other stuff with okay. with this video, so anybody yeah. watching it in the next week can uh, can also participate in that. And uh, I love the stuff you do. That's why I've told you you got free reign in uh, in in uh, any of the things that I'm, I'm in charge of, any groups that I run. And well, you and I have the same uh, same mindset to uh, helping people. You know, I have to share, I, I have a quote of the day um, that is on my browser every day. And today it really made me think of you and me and it's T.S. Eliot, be who you needed when you were younger. And we try to be the person we wish we had when we were young in stroke. So um, it's uh, just. Um, it's well, you've heard me say it a million times that, you know, you and I are trying to be the people we wish we could have talked to. Yeah. Well, after we had a stroke, but they didn't exist. I don't know if I can, if anybody can read this or not. This oh, is it. I haven't been to a, uh, I haven't been to, a, I hadn't gotten a fortune cookie in like 10 years. And, and this is my fortune it says, those who help are helped. That goes That's for plants too, by the way, uh, Sophia. And I'm not sure, I, you have two daughters and I'm not sure that one looks younger than the other one, but your other daughter who was talking to us last week, She's a stroke coach, whether you know it or not. Your daughter's a stroke coach. Take advantage of her. I'm not sure if that was, you have two daughters, right? I don't, I don't, all I saw last week was she kind of poked her, her head in a little bit, but <laughs> I listened to the things that she said and I listened to the things that- Yeah, the that older one, she's about. tough. She Very is, stubborn. She's, tough. she's a stroke coach. She loves you. Yes. She wants I the told best. Her, for you. If I'm gonna walk, it's because of you. Well, a I good really coach. Well, and you. A good coach need, needs to know, and Michelle will tell you this is really difficult. You need to know like when somebody needs a hug and when they need a kick in the butt. Yeah. No, it looks like I need a lot of hugs sometimes. Yeah. We all do. understand sometimes, but you know, I'm in pain. My hips, my legs, my arms, everything hurts. It's just hard sometimes. Well, your daughter may not be able to understand that in, because, yeah. in the way that you experience it because she hasn't had a stroke, but I can tell you that she's empathetic mm -hmm. and I can tell you that she's on your side and I can tell you she's smart and I can tell you that you have a stroke coach in your house. So yes. see what you guys can do together. Power of two, more than the power of one. Stronger. It's interesting that that came up. It's funny how things come up in life. That's actually the name of a, a program in, um, in, in uh, Annapolis, Baltimore, Maryland, the power of two. It's kind of like stroke buddies. What they do is um, it's kind of like stroke ambassadors and Craig. So they visit people in the hospital now. Originally, they just uh, paired people up, like my concept was stroke buddies. If everybody had a stroke buddy, I mean, essentially, uh, it's a coaching thing, isn't it? So they pair people up, stroke survivors, uh, veterans, and they use the term, she used the term veteran, uh, Michelle, <laughs> which is funny because, of course, I told her a few months ago we got we decided that we were veterans not pay it forward people or either one works <laughs> <Or both. laughs> either one both work but so the power of two is the concept of they now they meet you in the hospital and then they stay with you it's like a mentor but it's a coach i mean you can say coach you can say trainer you can say mentor you can say daughter you can say helper uh it's all the same. So you have some support in your house and I would uh, see if you could take advantage of it. I am trying. They're my helpers. They're my coaches. They're my everything. 
Good. So, you probably already do this, but let them know that. I do. I tell them every day how much I appreciate them. Without them, I don't know what I would be right now. Well, that's good. That's, you know, forming that bond again. And of course, you have a special bond because you're your blood you know they're your daughters so they want the best for you of course but family uh, you know michelle will tell you anybody who's been around the stroke groups at all will tell you that family are miserable behave miserably often i i it's one of the things that i just i fail to understand you don't understand it either do you michelle i don't you understand feel? some yeah. people's families are just so unsupportive and just can be downright mean. Mean. Oh, yeah. Yeah, my. But so you're very lucky, Zofia. And, and, and maybe they're your, your purpose for survival at the moment. And maybe that purpose will transform into something else when, when you find a, a greater purpose. But, but for now, let them be your purpose. And embrace them and see where it takes you. You might find your purpose. You know, uh, I like the Yogi Bear, and there are, I have. I need to post this one. I think I mentioned it a week or two ago. In stroke recovery, you know, we don't always know what the right answer is. And Yogi has a famous quote: "If you come to a fork in the road, take it." That means, like, you know, try this, try that. To me, I mean, he was trying to be funny. I, I made up a meme about it. I haven't posted it. Uh, he has another quote. Baseball is 90% um, mental and the other half is physical. Of course, that adds up to 140%. But it's true. And I changed the word baseball to stroke and put a picture of Yogi Berra. Stroke is 90% mental and the other half is physical. I love that. <laughs> and if you, go, if you come to a fork in the road, take it. You know, try everything. See where things will lead you. Okay. I uh, would, yeah. That's I. I really like that. Well, plus, sometimes the universe does things for us. Okay, so I'm in PT right now. Um, the doctor said, "Hey, do you want to go to a, a hip and pelvic floor <laughs> specialist?" I said, "Sure." So I called the number that they gave me, and they referred me to another number at MUSC. And uh, so I went to see uh, Aaron, Dr. Aaron Brown, and uh, I was saying something last week about, well, since you're the hip specialist, I decided, oh, first I got there, he said, I'm not a neuro. He, he knew I had a stroke. He didn't know that how much importance I placed on neuro. So I said, well, what happens if your methods, your orthopedic methods fail? He said, I'll find you a neuro. I said, let's go. I also said, um, uh, main reason I'm here is to pick your brain and ask you questions. If I can get better, then great. But, you know, physical therapists to me are like a source of information. And he said, ask away. And I said, I literally pointed at him and said, you're my boy. So this week, so I decided to let the universe, I, I decided not to buck the whole thing and insist on a neuro. I decided to try and see what happened. Okay. So last week I'm talking about, well, you're the neuro, you're the pelvic floor specialist. And he says, um, actually, I'm not. That's another Aaron over at the other place. And so I told him, I said, you know what? What we're doing is working. It's good. I'm just going to leave it alone. So sometimes you don't know what the universe might have in store for you. So. Uh, but most times you don't. Most times you don't. So maybe there's some reason in there between you and your daughters and everything that you can work out. I bet you they'd be willing to help you or find somebody to um, build you a little garden. Uh, Polly's got, you know, growing tomato plants. She did it last year, too. I mean, she grew tomatoes and ate them on her back porch. So do what makes you happy. Well, we beat this. Uh, we've been doing this for an hour and a half. Oh, hey, geez. Yeah. It's probably, I told everybody that you and I could talk for four hours or <laughs> six hours. So, um, and we got managed to get coaching and 
training and everything mindset and everything back in there and we didn't need core i didn't think we'd need core although i will say with core <laughs> um every other month i'm gonna throw this out there every other month in 20 in 2022 i'm doing 22 days of 22 exercises and in may i'm doing it again and the exercises are all core and so i know you're going to link to the youtube channel but that starts May 1st, so core exercises. Um, the first third or roughly third are gonna be seated. The next third are going to be standing and then I'm doing a third on the floor. And so, um, and but if you need some seated core exercises, I have 30 days of those from 2020 on my YouTube yep. channel. So uh, we can core all day, there you go. <laughs> yep. Look up, uh, if you don't know, look up uh, McGill Curl. Okay. It's a core exercise. It's like sort of like a sit-up, but okay. you, you engage your core first right. and you only raise your shoulders. Mm -hmm. There's actually the McGill Big Three also, but one's a bird dog. I can't remember what the third one is. They're all three good core exercises. Okay. But he developed, a, it's a guy named uh, uh, McGill, like the university in um, Montreal, but I don't think he's associated with it. Uh, that's just how I remember the name. And he did a whole series on these curl-ups because they're real good for core. I mean, my PT taught them to me last week. And he had me engage my core first. And I, I'm a person like you, of course. Michelle, I want to know. Somebody tells me it's going to engage your core muscles. I go home. What do I do? I put my, I put my fingers right there when I'm doing it, and I check and see what muscles it's doing because I want to know that I'm doing it right and that that it's working. And these things are tough, but they 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 work real well, and uh, they're good. So. Hey, we managed to get core in, so yeah, yeah. I had to throw it in there. Just okay, so, coming up, so so now we're we're free to close the meeting out, I guess. <laughs> right.